The Bothy Storytelling Podcast is a member of the Alberta Podcast Network, powered by ATB. Welcome to the Bothy Storytelling Podcast. I'm your host, Callum Lycan. And today's episode's a bit of an unusual one. I had taken a wee trip to BC recently. I'd been asked to go out and do some events. And what you're going to hear today is the recordings of uh, some of those shows. I'm not going to lie to you, they're a wee bit rough. They were recorded in my Zoom H5. I didn't have any microphone fitted in. We didn't have anything there to work that. And if I remember correctly, this particular recording was actually done from a kind of like... 45 degree angle behind me. But before we get into any of those wee stories, let's hear a word from one of our sponsors. And today's sponsor is the ATB Entrepreneur Centre. If you're starting to build a business, ATB's Entrepreneur Centre is a great resource. They can help with banking and set you up with a mentor. They are also opportunities for networking and workshops to help make local connections within the community. Just another way, ATB will always be more than a bank. Visit your locations in Edmonton, Calgary and Lethbridge. And if you're interested in finding out more, uh, the site is atbentrepreneurcentre.com. That's atbentrepreneurcentre.com. So this episode is pretty much just uh, one of my live shows from uh, BC. This one was in... No, this is in fact one which is in uh, Parksville, if memory serves. As I say, the recording's uh, not the best. Uh, You know, I'm not going to lie to you, it's not high quality. It's a live recording. The angles aren't quite right, but you'll hear enough of the stories and hopefully have fun. You will have heard some of these stories before, but the reality is these are live, so it'll give you a little bit of a different feel Uh, And hopefully a wee laugh and a giggle and enjoy the stories. So here is part one of Brave and Free from Parksville on the island from BC. So good evening ladies and gents and thank you very much for coming out and joining me and everyone else here this evening. As you can tell, I am Scottish. (laughs) I'm not from around these parts and I have had on many occasions when I come to do events people asking in Canada, are you Scottish? So I kind of make sure that everybody knows that I am 100% Scottish. Now, when I do any storytelling event, I am just always working in what I was taught in Edinburgh, and we call it the Cayley culture. Now, for those that know a Cayley, it's now a dance and it's all about the music. But the traditional Cayley wasn't that. Your traditional Cayley in the Highlands all those moons ago was all about song, story, music, food and drink. The community would gather in one of the houses after the hard day's work and there they would just bond and have fun and of course do what the Scots are notorious for doing, which is drinking an awful lot. <laughs> oh, it's one of the greatest occupations of Scotland. But Scotland has got a wealth of tales. It's got a wealth of history. And it makes my job so much easier because it gives me hundreds and hundreds of stories to tell events. I will be honest and say I've got about 300 locked up in here. And quite often when I'm doing an event, I kind of talked to my audience. Uh, I wasn't allowed to tonight. I was was told I wasn't allowed to talk to you beforehand. But what I do is I usually talk to you and have a chat. And it gives me a few kind of uh, moments. And it fires up the old brain. And it gives me a few stories to tell throughout the night. Because I always like to do that, just kind of working on what I've been discussing with people. But that didn't happen tonight. Until somebody asked me, about this. <laughs> because you know what? It, it, it's one of those things that everyone... I mean, who doesn't like a man in a kilt? <laughs> well, obviously some of the audience don't. That's obvious. But a man in a kilt is just one of those recognisable things. You see a stone about the place and you just know, hopefully, that they're Scottish. 
And I often get asked about my guilt, so I thought I'd just do a very quick couple of minutes and explain what I'm wearing, because it just helps you understand. You all know the kilt. You all know what we call the dress kilt, or the filly bag, as we call it. That is uh, basically the short kilt that you see, but that isn't... I'm going to get shot when I say this, because there's a gentleman in the front row who's going to glower at me for saying this. <laughs> but it's no quite a proper kilt. It's actually a much later construct. What the Scots traditionally wore was this. I've got to keep watching that mic. Like, booming into it. And it's the philomore, or the plaid, or great kilt. And this, ladies and gents, is a blanket. <laughs> yeah. What you are seeing is basically about six yards of material, double width, which every time when I put it, go to put it on, I have to throw it out on the ground, get down on my hands and knees, and pleat it. And then, when I've got it to my size, I lie on top, put a belt underneath, I fold, I fold, I tighten the belt, and then I stand up. And then I have to go and adjust it and tuck it. And that's why, and sorry gents, this one is just for the ladies, that's why I have this. <laughs> Because this is basically just the, the extra kill. You're used to that kind of way. Yeah. So this is basically the traditional Highland kill. How many Outlander fans do we have in the audience? <laughs> so you know what I'm talking about when you, you, with the traditional kill, the Jacobean era and beyond. And it would have been a very simple woven kill, not the bright colours that we've got today because the looms didn't manage to do it. They only had very basic looms in a lot of the farms. So it would have been very natural, earthy tones that the kilts would have been. But the thing is, if you're Scottish, a lot of the Scots know that what we wear today aren't necessarily the right colours, or should I say the right kind of original kilts, but we wear them with pride and love, because it is our national dress and it's our identity. This is uh, my ancient weathered Macpherson tartan from the Isle of Skye. I'm also a Macdonald and a Buchanan. Uh, in the Scottish system, quite often you get multiple plans from your mother because the women obviously get married to different families quite often and they, uh, they take the name with them. Like my mother is called Mary Murdoch McMaster um, Holden uh, something, something, something. It's a ridiculous name she has. Don't tell her I said that. Don't ever say that. But that's just a wee bit about the kill and basically what we wear. Um, what I will say to you though is this, this kilt takes bravery, right, I'm standing up here, I'm going to say, this is the bravest kilt to ever wear, because what you need to understand, if you've ever worn a kilt, you've got the buckles, and then you put your belt on, so you've got a few safety nets there, I'm standing up here being held together by one belt. <laughs> Do you know how terrifying that is? <laughs> like if that belt goes, there's, it's just material and whatever. <laughs> and we'll leave it there because that's a myth we never dispel in Scotland. <laughs> but it is, I love wearing this kilt. I've travelled everywhere in it. I've travelled uh, to Canada and I've travelled through America in it and to Europe in it. And it pretty much is just one of those things that opens doors for you. People love seeing you in a kill and they love chatting to you. So I've had great fun in this. But I was saying to my lovely hosts um, in the last couple of days, I've had some adventures. And one of the greatest adventures that I ever had in this kill was when I decided to go to San Francisco in it. And uh, I went through Edinburgh, jumped on the plane sat in the plane for eight hours, realised that pleats and eight hours are not very comfortable. <laughs> then got off in Chicago to do the transfer, walked up to the security gate, and basically that horrid sound hit me. That beep. And then the security guard walked up to me and said, can you take your belt off, sir? <laughs> Now, I can only imagine I went white at this moment in time, that I was, I was thinking this is not happening, I hadn't even considered this as a potential, and I had to say no, 
<laughs> and all of a sudden, the sun was eclipsed. <laughs> they, built, they built them big down there. Those security, they're like, I don't know, half troll or something. They're monstrous lads. And all of a sudden, he stood up and he's like, sorry. And I said, I can't take off this belt. And he was just like, you know, you can see him starting to get a wee bit. I think his hand went under to push a button. We've got a yeah. troublemaker here. Yeah. All of a sudden, I'm seeing movement all around me as other security guards move in, and I'm starting to think this is it. I'm not even got into America, and I'm in trouble. You know, I'm too pretty for jail. That's what I'm saying. So there I am at security, and I'm standing there, and I'm thinking, what am I going to do? And again, they ask, could you take your belt off? And I said, I can't. And as I'm standing there, that beautiful Scottish... Thing. I don't know if, how many of you are of Scottish ancestry, but we have a, a, a certain cheeky nature in Scotland. We're, we're either all in or we're out. And it's, it's literally, on this occasion, I realised, well, I'm either in jail or I've got to go for it. <laughs> so I just stood there and I said, I cannot take off my belt. You have two options, sir. You can either cart me off to the cell and question me, or... <laughs> You can make me take off my belt and cart me off to the cell <laughs> because of another reason. <laughs> and of course, that was that beautiful moment when all of a sudden, as I said this, I, I did say it a little bit more crudely, but I'm trying to be polite tonight for this yeah. lovely audience. But all of a sudden, I saw that look of... <gasps> and he looked down, which was a bit disconcerting. Um, and he was like, you mean it's true? <laughs> it's, it's true? <laughs> And all of a sudden, they started coming in, and I thought, what's going on? And all of a sudden, he's like, yeah, it's true, it's true. It's true. It's true. It's true. <laughs> and then he started asking me about the film, and I've got to admit, it was one of those beautiful moments. I love storytelling, and one of the reasons I love it is because it can happen in the most unusual and unique environments. So I want you to imagine now, me before I've entered America, now talking about the kilt. Talking about how you throw it out in your hand printer, how you lie down, you wrap it, and you put the belt on. And talking about all this, all of a sudden I've got a group of people around me, visitors coming into America, and they're thinking, oh, we're getting a kilt demonstration here. And I hadn't even entered the country yet. So I love wearing the kilt because it leads to some great moments. It leads to some fun incidents. And to be honest, it also leads to the, a beautiful kind of Scottish tradition that I've lived by my whole life as a storyteller. The Cayley culture and kind of just talking about what I do. But today, it's traditional tales of Scotland, not tales about me and my antics, which, no, no, it's a whole different show. So I was thinking about what nice stories I could tell you. And Scotland is just filled with them. We've got brownies, selkies, bogles, uh, kelpies, the unicorn. <laughs> yeah. What's your national animal, Canada? <laughs> the beaver. Yeah. We have the unicorn. <laughs> yes. Does that not tell you a lot about Scotland? <laughs> we went for a mythical creature because it was about the only hope we ever had. You know? But Scotland is filled with beautiful stories, and I thought I'd start with a love story. Does anybody object to a love story to get the evening going? Excellent. In Scotland, we have many a beastie, as I say, and one of my favourites are the Selkie. Now, is anyone familiar with the Selkie? Fantastic. If you're not, the Selkies are seal people. They are seals in the water, but it's said that when they come onto land, they are the most stunning of creatures. They peel off their skin to reveal a beautiful woman or man. Most of the stories revolve around beautiful selkie wives, and they are said to be the most beautiful. They have long, dark, flowing hair. They have the most perfect skin, almost pearly translucent. Their eyes, like, as in the seal world, are big, and beautiful and brown. They are perfection. And in all the coastal towns of Scotland, they're talked about, even to this day, the, the sea, the fishermen in that have a great reverence for the seals because they might be a selkie, and you never know. It might be your next wife. <laughs> so they're all very respectful. Oh, I love them. In fact, on a wee side note, 
There are actually towns in Scotland, little fishing villages, isolated ones, that to this day believe they are still from the line of the Selkie themselves. They actually come from that line, they say. And if you visited one of these towns, they are the more isolated fishing villages. But in all honesty, the biggest skeptic could actually believe it. Because quite often the people of the town are, they have got the long dark hair, they have got big beautiful brown eyes, and they do have a pale skin. And they're all stunning. Which is a hard thing to say, we're not the broadest in Scotland, I'll say that. But these villages believe they are from that line. But Selkies are a great, great tale. And the one I want to tell you is actually an Ayrshire tale. Uh, there are variations all up and down the coast, but the one that I was always taught was from a little fishing village in Ayrshire by the name of Dunoon. And if you've ever visited Dunoon, it's a beautiful seaside village. It's got the ruins today of the kind of Watchtower Castle there. And it's just a stunning little coastal place. And I remember when I was a lad, there used to be lots of seals up and down that coast. But the naval bases and that chased them all away. But this is all about a fisherman. And he's a lonely man. He lives in a wee cottage on the hill. And his life is just filled with sadness. Every day, he goes out fishing by himself. He comes home and he mends his nets by himself. Lives in that wee cottage on the hill and tends the land around it. And it's all just loneliness in himself. And I mean, even when he goes into that wee village, he goes into the tavern when he can afford a wee whiskey, his gold comfort, he calls it. He sits at the bar by himself. None of the men will talk to him. None of the women will walk out with him. And it's because he was born with a blazing birthmark down one side of his face. The devil's mark, as it was traditionally known as in Scotland. This man was cursed, and no one would go near him. So his life was just lonely. Now one night, after he was in the tavern, he decided he was going to head home, but you know what, he couldn't bear it. He couldn't bear the thought of going to that wee empty cottage. And as the moon was high in the heavens, he thought to himself, I'll take a walk down the beach. You know, the sound of the pebbles and the waves, just that lapping, gentle, caressing sound would often soothe his soul. So he started to walk. And as he walked, listening to the waves, the moon beating down on him, he was just, he was starting to feel happy. But then he heard it. The most unexpected noise. Something you don't expect to hear in the middle of the night. Laughter, singing, dancing. And as he listened, it entranced him. He couldn't believe what he was hearing. Such a beautiful sound in the middle of the night. And his feet started to take him that way. And soon enough, he came up to a rocky outcrop. And as he came round it, his jaw dropped and he stopped still because there they were, dancing wild in the moonlight, their hair flailing, a beautiful song coming from their lips and as naked as the day they were born. And our fisherman stopped and stared. Never before had he seen such a beautiful sight, these women just dancing wildly under the moon. And before he knew what he was doing, he started to crouch down behind a rock where he sat and watched them, <coughs> mesmerised by their image. And it wasn't until the first rays of light came up over the hills that he realised that he'd been sitting there all night. But as soon as those first rays of light touched that rock, all of a sudden, the scene ended. The singing stopped, the dancing stopped, and the women gave a little shriek and started to run towards him. For the first time he realised what he'd done. He'd been sitting there gawping at them all night. What are they going to think of him? But as he was puzzling over this conundrum, for the first time he saw it. His eyes drifted down and there he saw what looked like beasts 
lounging in the rocks not far from him, and the women were running towards them. And one of them grabbed one of the beasts, ran to the water's edge, threw it on their shoulders and dove into the water. And as the fishermen watched, a seal head rose above the waves. And that's when he realised. He'd been watching the Selkie wives, all those old wives' tales, all the fishermen's nonsense in the bar that he'd heard was real. These were the Selkie wives. And one by one by one they came and snatched their skins until one skin was left. He doesn't know what took him. He doesn't know why he did it. But he leapt out and he grabbed that skin and clutched it to his chest. She ran towards him and then skidded to a halt, screaming as she saw this stranger holding her skin. And she started to cry and beg and wail, give me my skin, please, give me my skin. I need it to go back to the sea. And her fisherman, all he could do was shake his head. She begged, she pleaded, she wailed. But her fisherman just stood there until eventually all he could say was no. I'm so lonely. And as the Selkie wife stood watching him, she saw the tear run down his cheek and she realised that this man, he wasn't evil. There was no malice in this man. She looked into his eyes and she saw the depth of pain and loneliness. And something in her heart changed. She started to talk to him. They discussed their lives. He told her all about the loneliness and why no one would talk to him. And as they talked, she realised that this man was a good man. And eventually, she came to an agreement with him. She agreed that she would live with him. She would return to his little cottage and she would live with him for seven years and a day. And she would make him happy. But at the end of that, he would return the skin so she could return to the sea. And that day, for the first time in his life, that fisherman walked down the beach and not alone. He walked down with a beautiful woman at his side and his heart started to burst with joy. He returned to his little cottage and not alone. And as the days ticked by, the friendship started to blossom. As the weeks ticked by, they decided to become man and wife. And it was said in that wee fishing village, never a finer wedding or a bonnier bride had been seen. And months ticked by and the year came in and all of a sudden the two became three. All of a sudden as the years went by, the three became four, the four became five and now our fisherman was surrounded by love, his beautiful wife and his bairns. Never in all his days could he imagine such a thing. And life was good. And as the years went by, he would go out fishing. He would provide for his family, knowing every day he was out in that water, he'd be coming home to his family. Now one day, he was out on the waves. He was fishing. It was a beautiful day. But as he was there and kind of waiting for the nets to come in, he was listening, as he often did, to the waves and the movement. And as he listened, he thought he heard a voice, a whispering voice on the water. And it said, release her. Let her be free. Let her return to her people of the sea. And as the fisherman listened to this voice over and over, he realised how selfish he'd been keeping her away from the waves, keeping her away from the water. And a tear rolled down his scarred face as he rowed back to the land and went to where he'd hid her skin, took it and walked into the house. He walked up to her and simply said, take it. 
take it and return to your people of the sea. And she stood there. She couldn't believe what she was seeing. Here he was, this man, this lonely man who'd found love and family and he was willing <clears throat> to sacrifice it all and let her return to her people. And as she looked into his eyes, seeing the love burning there, she realised this is where she belonged. This was her family. And she looked at him and said, take it, burn it, destroy it. I have no need for it. <clears throat> Sorry, folks. I warm you. <clears throat> <clears throat> I have no need for it. This is my family. This is where I belong. And the fisherman took that skin. His heart bursting. Now he realised he would never need to fulfil that promise. She wanted to be with him till the end of days. And life went on day by day, week by week, month by month. Their hearts were filled with love and joy. Now, one day he was out fishing. And it was one of those offy days. You know, the waves were just rocky. The, the clouds were grey, the boat was getting whipped about, and the nets were catching nothing. Longer and longer he was out on the waves. And back at the cottage, his wife was doing the chores. She was getting things ready. And their youngest daughter, Ailey, was playing about her feet. And you know what it's like when the young one gets under your feet. Eventually you can take it no more. And she says to her, away outside lassie and play. Stop getting under my feet. And Ailey, well, she knew exactly where to go. There was one place that she loved to play. And that was the old fishing hut. Where the dad kept their nets and the creels. Mountains of nets to climb up. Tunnels of creels to crawl through. And Ailey loved it. And as she was climbing one of those mountains, the net moved. And a huge chest crashed down beside her. And it spilled out its treasure. And what a treasure it was. Ailey looked at it. She'd never seen the likes of it. It had all the colours of the rainbow. It was the most beautiful looking thing she'd seen. And when she touched it, wow, it was so silky soft. It was beautiful. And she knew her mother would love to see it. She ran into the kitchen, bursting on the door, screaming, Mum, Mum, look what I've found! She was standing with her back to the door at the sink. She didn't need to turn round. The smell of the salt air was already filling her nostrils. She knew Ailey had found her skin. She turned round to see her beautiful lassie beaming, holding it out to her. Just, just one touch. One touch won't make a difference. As she reaches out and gently touches her old skin. Just to hold it, to hold it in my hands, that won't, it won't matter at all. As she reaches out and feels it in both her hands. Just to hold it to my breast, it won't mean a thing. It just won't mean a thing. But as soon as she pinned that skin to her chest, she knew the mistake she'd made. The salt air filled her nostrils. The sensation of diving through the depths covered her whole body. And she knew she was lost to the sea. And when her husband came home that night, he knew it too. He saw the sea change in her face. He knew she had to return. She kissed her bairns goodbye in her sleep. And hand in hand, husband and wife walked down to the rocks, the place that they first met. 
Before she dove into the waves, she looked at him. She told him that she loved him and then said, if ever there comes a time when you still have need for me, but the bairns no longer have need for you, come to this place. Come to this place and call. And with that, she dove into the sea. At the place they first met, they parted. And the fisherman, with a heavy heart, walked back to his little cottage because the bairns still had need for him. And the years ticked on and they started to grow until one day the two eldest came to their father. <coughs> Dad, it's time. We need to leave. We want to take the boats to the new world. We want our own lives. And with that, they were gone on the boats. A week passed before word came to the shores. The boats had all been caught in a storm and all aboard had perished. So now, in our little cottage by the sea, it was our fisherman and his youngest daughter, Ailey. And of course, Ailey grew and Ailey blossomed until the day came that he knew was coming. She had become a bonnie lassie and it was her time to leave. She came to her father, it is time, Dad. I need to go. I want to see the world. I want to find myself a man. And with that, she too was gone, leaving her fisherman once more alone in his little cottage by the sea. And as the days ticked by, his heart grew heavy. As the weeks went by, he stopped fishing. He stopped mending his nets. He stopped tending the garden. In fact, the villagers would often see him just walking up and down the shoreline as if he was listening to the waves. One day, as he did take his solemn walk, a thought came to him. And it was as if once more the waves reminded him of his wife's words. If ever there is a time for the you, the, if, whenever, if ever there is a time that the children no longer have need for you, but you still have need for me, come to this place. Come to this place and call. And with his heart beating strongly, with his head filled with those thoughts, he ran full pelt to that rocky outcrop and he screamed and bellowed into the waves. And true to her word, through the waves she came up and she took his hand and she led him down, down into the green depths of the ocean to the Selkie Kingdom, a kingdom of coral and shell, of seaweed and joy. And for years they lived under the ocean in their home, living amongst all the fish and Selkies. Until one day, word came through the waves. Ailey had returned to the cottage. Their youngest daughter had returned and she was married and she was heavy with bairn. What a joyous day this was for the mother and father and of course his first thought was we must see the bairn. We must visit the bairn when it's born. But she looked at him and said we can do this but if we do we can no longer live above, on the land, or below, in the sea. And for days, he thought this over and thought long and hard, but the pull of kith and kin was too strong, until eventually he agreed, so be it. And when word came through the water that the child was born, husband and wife swam to the shore, and there on the rocky outcrop, removed their seal skin and once more took human form. They walked hand in hand along the beach, heading towards the wee cottage. And there she was. There was their youngest daughter, blooming with motherhood, bursting with joy to see her mum and dad. They hugged, they embraced, and then they met their new son. A strapping lad he was, and they hugged him too. 
with the prize. The prize was in the cradle, and it was such a bonny wee girl, a beautiful baby girl. They cuddled her, they kissed her, they snuggled her, and they put a pearl on the piddle, a sea, a hansel for the bear. And that night, a family reunited. Never a finer night would you have seen song and dance and story and food and drink as they all reconnected. A fine evening. But as the first rays of light started to come over those hills, they knew it was time to leave. <coughs> they kissed their daughter. They hugged their son, their new son, and they kissed their brave baby girl. They said farewell to their family, and hand in hand, husband and wife, walked down to the beach to greet their last sunrise. And it was said that when the fishermen came out to take their boats, there they found, lying on the beach, two seals, dead, but with their fins tightly embraced. There's a wee warm room this ladies and gents. So, it's a wee bit of a longer story. Um, I promise it won't all be that long. But there is love in Scotland. Love for many things. And I mentioned the other one, whiskey. Um, we love our whiskey, and whiskey was one of those great drinks, I'll tell you. I mean, I love it. I, I, any whiskey drinkers in the audience? Yeah, good, good, good. Isla Malts, I recommend it. If, you ha if you're not a whiskey drinker and want to sample, always go for the Isla Malts, a true earthy piece of Scotland. But whiskey, at one point in Scotland, was actually allowed to be made by everyone. Uh, the idea of it being a kind of government sanctioned drink didn't exist. People had stills all over the country trying to make their own whiskey. But then the government, of course, did step in. And uh, in Scotland, we just found this to be a great game. <laughs> oh, God. The government trying to take away our whiskey. So what we actually started doing, this is documented even outside Edinburgh, where I lived for many years, we would set up like 10 just fake stills in the countryside. So the excise men were running about like heedless chickens, trying to find the proper whiskey. But just outside Edinburgh, there was actually a wee village, and it was a, a mecca. It was a, a place where all the whiskey went through, both legal and illegal. And it's villagers, well, well, they were having a great time. Let's be honest, they were drinking the whiskey, they were having fun, Kayleys almost every night, of course, Saturday night being the big Kaylee, and then it was dance, it was song and story and food and drink, and everyone was happy, apart from one man. Because, of course, in those days, there was two institutions that didn't like the whiskey. The first was the government, the second was the church. And Scotland is a deeply religious country. So the, the ministers back then were dead against it. I believe in this day and age they do enjoy a wee dram themselves now. But back then it was the devil's drink. Every sermon was about the devil's drink. Of course. This is contrary to what, uh, contradicting what we called it, which was things like the water of life <laughs> and sunshine in a glass. <coughs> but this wee village, it had one of those old hellfire and brimstone ministers. And for those that were raised in Scotland, you probably encountered one in your days over there. They were a very staunch bunch, and this man was. He was having that awful time. Every sermon he would be up there. Hellfire and brimstone. The evils of the devil's drink. And this was his sermons every Sunday, trying to convince his congregation to stop their evil ways. And it was failing. <laughs> it was failing miserably. He could not get through to them one bit. So our poor minister thought long and hard. He 
tried as hard as he could every week, but he realised words. Words weren't working. He had to come up with an example. The Bible was filled with them. How could he not come up with an example? And then one day, it was like that ray of light, and he realised, I've got it. So he prepared for his next sermon. He was ready. And he was just in time for the annual gathering of the villagers. This was the biggest caling. This was the party to end all parties. Saturday night, the village was jumping. And the next day, as they walked into the church, you could see the excess. They're all green at the gills. They're all peely wally and sweating with a drink. And he realises this is the time to stop this nonsense. And of course, the congregation see it. It's in his face. He's got that in him, that glowering, miserable look. They know they're in for a tongue lashing this morning. And none of them are looking forward to it. So they sit in their pews and they wait. And once everyone's settled, it begins. Hellfire and brimstone. For years I've been telling you all about the evils of the devil's drink. And none of you have listened. So now I'm going to teach you. I'm going to show you what the evils do to you. And with that, he reached under the pulpit. He pulled out a glass. And he raised it high. And it was crystal clear and beautiful. And everybody in the congregation had a wee bit of a truth on them from the drink. So they kind of looked with a little bit of envy at God's finest drink, water. And then he reaches under the pulpit once more and he pulls something out that gets everyone gasping because he pulls from under the pulpit a wriggly, jiggly worm. God's finest creature. And he holds the glass of water in where we flourish. He drops that worm into the glass of water. And he swirls it about. And then he pulls the worm out and everyone can see that wee worm's fine. It's still wriggling about. And he looks at it and says, see how God tends for his beasties. And everyone kind of nods. And then he reaches under the pulpit again. And he pulls out a second glass. And all of a sudden, the whole congregation starts to kick up. Because this glass is golden and beautiful looking. And he holds it up and says, the devil's drink. Now, for anyone who's a whiskey drinker in the room, you'll understand why the congregation picked up here. Because he has just pulled out the finest, finest combination to man. Whiskey of water. It's perfect. But he holds up that glass, proud, and he says, now see what the devil's drink does to you. And he takes that worm again and with a flourish, worthy of a magician, he drops it into the glass. And as soon as that wee beast touches it, it goes stiff and sinks to the bottom. And the minister looks up proudly at the glass, looks over his congregation who are a wee bit like, oh, <laughs> what do you all make of that? He exclaims. Now, as he's waiting for a response, he is ignoring the little comments like, you know, that's an awful shame. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. It's oh, a terrible waste of whiskey, man. <laughs> he ignores all those comments that are going throughout the room and he's waiting. And waiting. And it's silence. He's starting to worry. What's going on with this group of people? And then, blessed be at the back of the room. Excuse me, sir. Excuse me. I've got it. It's sunken perfectly, sir. I know what you're trying to tell us all this fine morning. 
You're trying to tell us that if we've got the worms, we've to drink whiskey. <laughs> Uh, ladies and gents, we'll take a, a very short break there and we'll convene in about 10 minutes, 10, 15, 10, 15 minutes. 10, 15 minutes. So I would suggest, I think we've got some uh, beverages. No yeah. whiskey, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> 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 bring it. <laughs> so thank you very much. Get some fresh air. This room is uh, a little bit warm, but thank you for joining me for the first half. And I hope you all come back for the second half. Thank you. <laughs> Well, hopefully you enjoyed those uh, stories and that first half of Brave and Free, Traditional Tales of Scotland, the live show I did in Parksville. And let's move on with our book recommendation. And I think one of the books that I need to recommend this time is actually one of the stories I told there, the Whiskey Lesson story. And it comes from a book from a wonderful Scottish storyteller called Stuart McHardy. Now, I've met Stuart. I've uh, done a wee bit of work with Stuart. He quite often works with the wonderful Donald Smith from the Scottish Storytelling Centre. And Stuart is a historian and a storyteller, and he's a font of knowledge. But the book he has released is with Luth Press, Luth Storyteller, uh, Tales of Whiskey. The truth is, of course, that whiskey was invented for a single practical reason, to offset Scotland's weather. That's uh, basically the start of the back of the book. That gives you an idea of the type of book you're in for. Uh, basically, this is a great wee collection of stories about whiskey, the history of whiskey, anecdotes about whiskey, some of the great wee tales that have happened, all revo revolving around the waters of life. Uh, it's published by Luth Press Limited. It is Tales of Whiskey by Scottish storyteller Stuart McCarty. And of course, after our book recommendation, we always do our podcast recommendation. And this week's uh, Bothy Storytelling podcast recommendation is, again, from the Alberta Podcast Network, who we are a proud member of. The podcast that I'm going to recommend for this episode is Tomato Radio. We've um, had plenty of stories today, and of course, one of the, the funnier ones was the Whiskey Tale. So let's do a podcast relating to food and drink. The Tomato Radio is a podcast about food and drink, hosted by Mary Bailey and Amanda Leneve. Um, basically, it's part of the Alberta Podcast Network, Tomato Radio, and it's all about food and drink, hosted by Mary Bailey and Amanda Leneve. And that wraps up another episode of the Bothy Storytelling Podcast. This one has just been about a live show, but I thought maybe a wee bit of change, get back to the traditional stories for you, give you a wee experience of what I do when I'm out and about in a live performance. As I say, the recording was done in my Zoom H5, so I knew it wasn't going to be the best quality. It was a, a weird angle behind me, but you know what? It still works. You still get an idea, and hopefully you've enjoyed this episode. The next episode will, of course, be the Brave and Free Traditional Tales of Scotland, Part 2. So thanks very much for listening to this episode of the Bothy Storytelling Podcast. Please do get in touch at Callum Lycan, spoken word at gmail.com or at Callum Lycan Studio. But... I'll see you all and speak to you all on the next episode of the Bothy Storytelling Podcast. Bye.